Sheikh Imran Hossein, I, I'm very pleased to have you once again. It's a great honor. I have asked uh, subscribers for questions, so I, I have my own natural curiosity and questions from other people. And perhaps you'd like to introduce the, the mood and subject for today. We are uh, Morris uh, on the brink, perhaps, of a pit of fire. And uh, <coughs> I <coughs> am anticipating that an attack will be launched on Syria. Uh, kind of a desperado because everything else has failed and Putin checkmated them in Geneva and so now perhaps throwing caution to the wind just perhaps the Turkish armed forces might launch an attack on Syria and if that happens I think Putin is going to respond vigorously so we are standing at this moment on the brink of a pit of fire. Yes, Russia did voice um, uh, strong opinions regarding Turkey's stance. I, I, I detected uh, Russia's support for, for Syria not, uh, excuse me, for Turkey not to in interfere or involve. It, uh, at times Russia is ambiguous, but it was not ambiguous about telling Turkey not to get involved. Um, well, Lavrov, I don't know, the Russians give mixed signals. It, it, it's very encouraging that you suggest uh, they are steadfast behind Syria. They have just sent some ships to Tartus, correct? Yes, I've heard about that. Well, m many of the questions do revolve around Syria that I've been given by, by subscribers and, and, and people that follow you. Sh shall I read some out or shall we banter? Do please. Okay, just give me one second. I, I wasn't uh, entirely prepared, but they are here. So, um, well, I'll just start uh, ad hoc. When will the Arab world realize that it is better that the Shias and the Sunnis join hand in hand in promoting their agenda and to strengthen their position on the globe? Yes, there are one and a half billion Muslims, but how divided are they? And that is from a user 408 Magenta on YouTube. Uh, bringing about Shia Sunni solidarity uh, to face a common threat is uh, <coughs> not too difficult a proposition except that Saudi Arabia true to form from day one emerged on the screen of history in a very mysterious way and has consistently from day one functioned as a client of the Judeo-Christian Anglo-American Western Alliance. And uh, Saudi Arabia is a, it's an alliance of a political family, the family of Ibn Saud, and a religious movement, the normally referred to as the Wahhabi movement. The name Wahhabi has created problems and so they prefer to be called Salafi. And it is this religious movement which has been brainwashed, harnessed, programmed, and uh, <coughs> they are the ones who are now engaged in a vociferous, relentless attack on the Shia, religious and theological attack on the Shia, and uh, doing so in order to lay the foundations and to foment Shia-Sunni civil war in Islam. 
Uh, I believe I did make mention of this in our last interview, that this is the master plan to foment Shia Sunni civil war in the world of Islam. The fact that that civil war has not as yet broken out, it's, uh, it is something uh, commendable that uh, the rest of the world of Islam has not been seduced and uh, not uh, likely to be seduced. Unless, and of course, you have some act of monstrous terrorism uh, directed, for example, against the Shia, and then you blame the Sunni. Typical Zionist methodology. Or an act of monstrous terrorism against the Sunnis, and then you blame the Shia. So you can get them at each other's throats. Uh, I have been doing my bit, uh, Maris. I gave a lecture recently on the Shia, the Sunni, and the end time. And in that lecture, I pleaded for us to recognize this master plan of seeking to ferment Shia Sunni civil war in the world of Islam, and that we should try to ensure that we do not fall into that trap. And most of my listening audience and viewing audience fortunately are in agreement with me. So I have not lost hope. I believe that there is hope that we can avert Sunni Shia civil war in Islam. They have been successful in the sectarianism of everywhere, Iraq, now Syria. I mean, it, it is a, a tactic used. And, and uh, you, you said Saudi from the day one, but I, I, I believe there was a King Fahd in, in the 1980s who, who was actually revered quite highly, and he was assassinated, yes? It's, that's Faisal. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, that was King Faisal. Um, yes, we hold him in high esteem because he broke ranks with his family. When, uh, when Israel attacked in 1967, the surprise attack that took the Egyptian Air Force on the ground and destroyed it, um, Faisal, uh, that war, of course, saw Egypt and Syria and Jordan defeated. <coughs> Faisal quickly mended fences with Jamal Abdel Nasser. They, remember, they had a war, a proxy war in Yemen. Saudi Arabia was, was supporting one side of the war, and Egypt was supporting the other side. But Faisal moves quickly to mend fences with NASA, and then to prepare the Arabs for the war of 1973. And in 1973, uh, he was hoping, his, this was his prayer, that I want to pray in a free Jerusalem. Because Israel took East Jerusalem in 1967. So this was a change on the part of the Saudi leadership when Faisal was able to mend fences and build a common, common block. And then in 1973, he, did, he went more than that. Uh, in 1973, he imposed the oil embargo on the United States. But Kissinger outwitted him. <laughs> uh, the price of oil rose about 400% as a consequence of that war. The US dollar fell in value by 400% within one week. In consequence of that war and the imposition of an oil embargo. But Faisal then went on to forge an alliance with Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in Pakistan. And they then, both of them, achieved the, the significant success of hosting and organizing the Lahore Islamic Summit Conference 
in February 1974, and that was a threat. That the world of Islam was coming together as a united body. And the Western world and India didn't like that one bit. So the conference took place in February 1974, and India responded two months later. Indira Gandhi ordered the first nuclear explosion, and India joined the nuclear club two months later to send a message to the world of Islam that we're not going to tolerate your coming together as a united body uh, in, the, in the Lahore Islamic Summit Conference. Um, they then responded to that conference in, in, in typical uh, Zionist fashion in, in uh, plotting the assassination of Faisal the next year, in August 1975. And uh, as soon as Faisal was assassinated, the Saudi family turned U-turn and returned to the Western camp and has remained there since then as a client state. Uh, two years later, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was also overthrown uh, in Pakistan. And so these two major figures who had successfully organized the world of Islam in 1974 in that historic Lahore Islamic conference were both removed. Uh, it, it is because of this that Faisal has continued to be uh, recognized as someone different from the rest of the Saudi leaders. And we always pray for mercy on his soul. And I've heard you give a lecture on the fact that OPEC was formed as a, with the condition that oil would be traded in dollars. And this, I think, is how you mean he was outwitted. He was outwitted, yes. He was outwitted. Uh, Kissinger was brilliant. Di di right, excuse me, diabolically brilliant in that he was able to successfully persuade and convince Faisal that uh, the price of oil is going to go up and up and up and up and you're going, to be going, you're going to be getting more and more wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. All that you have to do is to peg the sale of oil to the U.S. dollar. This, of course, is in conflict with the law of Islam. But OPEC was formed as a cartel, and that was also in conflict with the law of Islam. And to violate the free and fair market, by insisting that you cannot buy oil other than with U.S. dollars. The bogus and fraudulent U.S. dollar was a, was a great coup on the part of Kissinger because the U.S. dollar after 1971, September 71, when Kissinger took it off, the, um, the gold standard part of Bretton Woods, the U.S. dollar would, was in a vulnerable position. And as a consequence of this, skillful work on the part of Kissinger in getting the Arabs to agree to Faisal to sell oil for gold, uh, sorry, to sell oil for the US dollar. And that, that was the birth of something that came to be known as the petrodollar. And that petrodollar kept the US <laughs> flying high for the next 30, 40 years. Yes. F flying high in B-52s. I have more questions here. Does, does the Sheikh think the crisis in Syria has caused the foretold split between Gog and Magog? Anonymous question. <coughs> it, it, is, uh, it is clear that Gog and Magog are now moving in the direction of a head-on collision, which we anticipated. Uh, Gog being the Anglo-American Zionist Alliance, which has NATO as its military arm, and Magog being Russia, but Russia is also Christian Russia. There are two Russias there. Um, and that conflict between Gog and Magog 
which is most likely to be one of the use of nuclear weapons, uh, appears to me to be now inevitable. Inevitable. It's just a matter of time. So yes, my answer is yes, indeed. Gog and Magog are now moving towards a head-on collision. And it's the Syrian crisis that has speeded this up. Our eschatology, Islamic eschatology, places the area of Syria and Turkey as the most vol volatile region of the world and the one which is going to witness the Great War. Okay, um, I move on. Uh, this question is from a user, Dina Pauli123. It seems more and more clear that the Islamists, such as the Muslim Brotherhood and the NTC in Libya, the rebels in Syria, the Islamists in Pakistan, all are working together with the Zionists. It seems after every overthrow of these Arab regimes, the governments are more open to Western influence and to invite the capitalists into their country. No, I don't think that is entirely correct. Uh, the world of Islam is not homogeneous. I have identified one sectarian movement that used to be called the Wahhabis, uh, who are being uh, exploited and used by a Pied Piper. And that Piper that Pied Piper plays the tune and they dance to the tune because they are deficient in understanding. They do not understand that they're being taken for a ride. Uh, the reason why the Zionists want these so-called Islamic governments in power around Israel is because these so-called Islamic governments can then be manipulated uh, by, remote, by remote control to act in a way that will provide Israel with causes bellum. Israel wants to wage a big war which will decimate the Arab population around the Holy Land, bring about a substantial reduction in the, in the population of the Arab world. Uh, but Israel does not want to wage that big war and appear as an aggressor. So she needs an excuse. And that excuse was uh, manufactured and it's, it is emerging. It began with the Arab Spring. And then uh, pre predictably with the emergence of so-called Islamic governments. Uh, but the stumbling block in the way is Syria. And if they do not succeed in Syria, the plans will go to naught. All fall down. So Syria is do or die for them. They cannot afford to fail. And this is why Hillary Clinton is now hysterical. The Russia and China will pay a horrible price. A reading between the lines, I believe it's a Turkish invasion of Syria that's coming, but I can be wrong. And so the bottom line is that the Islamic, so-called Islamic governments uh, emerging as part of a plan that will allow Israel to declare that we are now under grave threat, that Islam is rising in the world, and Islam constitutes a menace to Israel and to mankind. And that's, that seems to be the plan at work. But not all Muslims are like that. There are many, many Muslims who detest the Zionist and detest the Anglo-American uh, oppression, is NATO oppression of mankind, and uh, long for freedom, and uh, 
likely to turn uh, in a friendly way to Putin to forge an alliance which, with Russia in order to confront a common uh, enemy. I will continue with the questions, dear Sheikh. This is from Syrian Girl. She's well known on YouTube. Is there an end to the world? Is there an end of the world prophecy in Islam regarding Damascus? Yes, there is. Damascus occupies a very, very important position in Islamic eschatology. The Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, has prophesied a number of events which must occur before history can end. These events which will occur in the end time <coughs> have as their most important of all events the return of the Son of Mary, Jesus, the Son of Mary, the true Messiah. And uh, he's going to return, not in downtown Chicago, but in Damascus. In Damascus. And there's another divinely appointed figure in Islamic eschatology. You may have heard of the Imam al-Mahdi. One of the supreme figures of the Shia, but also accepted by the Sunni. Imam al-Mahdi will be in Damascus when Jesus returns. He'll be in a masjid or a mosque. The prayer is about to take place. The Antichrist and the Israeli armed forces are outside. And then Jesus descends in the masjid. And the Imam recognizes him and says, this is the son of Mary. In much the same way that John the Baptist, standing in the river, when he saw Jesus, he said, here he is. This is the man you've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. And so history repeats itself. <coughs> um, The Prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him about the Great War, uh, otherwise known as Armageddon, but we have a different word for it. Uh, it's called the Malhama. It's going to be fought by an army which is going to come out of Medina. But Medina means city. So you have the Medina of Chicago, and you have the Medina of New York, and you have the Medina of London. But there's one city in the world which is known as Medina of the Prophet, Medina to Nabi, which is in Saudi Arabia. So sometimes when the word Medina is used, it is confused with that Medina in Saudi Arabia. But in this particular case, it's the city. It does not identify the city. But the scholars who have studied the subject identify it as Damascus. That out of Damascus will emerge an army which is going to confront Rome. And in our last interview, we did take up the subject of Rome. That there was a room which was in Rome, in Italy, which was pagan. And then Constantine took it to Constantinople. And that became the second room, which was Christian. And then subsequently, some centuries later, Rome then became Christian, discarding its pagan roots. And then when Constantinople was conquered in 1453, Rome then went to Moscow. So in the Quran, when the Quran was revealed, Rome was Byzantium. But prior to the Quran, Rome was in Italy, Rome. So we now have two.
two rooms. We have one which is Eastern Christian, Eastern Christianity, Byzantium, which has Russia as its headquarters, and uh, a man named Putin is the new emperor <laughs> of Byzantium. When he visited Israel recently, he was hailed as the new emperor of Byzantium. And then we have the other room, which was pagan, and now it's Roman Catholic and Protestant, the Western one. So we're going to have, we have to face an enemy called Rome, which is going to land in that area between Turkey and Syria. And when, they, when their armed forces land over there, then this army is going to come out of Damascus to face them. And that's a big war, which we will win, we'll defeat them. And when we defeat them, that Muslim army will then go on to conquer Constantinople. Some of the major events still awaiting to occur in history are the return of Jesus, the conquest of Constantinople, which obviously would be liberation from the control of NATO, and the defeat of a Western army in the area between Syria and Turkey. And all of these have Damascus as their central point. So Damascus does play a very central role in Islamic eschatology. Thank you for clarifying that. At one point I thought you, you were talking about a Damascus army going to fight Rum, which is Russia, but, but you clarified that. Mm -hmm. So I'll move on to, to more questions. Um, well, th there have been increasing rumors and signs of a Zionist attack this summer in the London Olympics and the Big Ben. What is your opinion on this matter? What advice would you give to the people living in the UK? This is from a, a subscriber of the YouTube channel Daring Dean, and he lists all of your videos. So he forwarded these questions, this question. Uh, no one knows, of course, with certainty, when, where will the next terrorist attack take place. And uh, all I can say is, yes, it is likely. We know that this is part of their modus operandi, that they, they um, perpetrate false flag terrorism and then put the blame on us so it can give them an opportunity to wage greater wars. Um, what can we do? There's nothing we can do, nothing, to avert an act of terrorism which is planned in secret. We don't know when it's going to take place, where it's going to take place. But the world is not, uh, and uh, the world is not a, a haphazardly constituted world, not in Islam. The world is a moral order. There's a God who watches over all things. And in the Quran, he has assured us that they plan their plans. And I plan my plan. And I am the best of planners. And he's given us the assurance that the historical process it was is one in which truth must triumph over falsehood. Anything established on the foundations of falsehood, like 9-11, there are normal lies, Morris, and then there are great lies, and then there's 9-11. <laughs> Anything which is founded on falsehood, on deception, on oppression, must eventually be vanquished. And truth must triumph. Justice must triumph over injustice. And so we prepare ourselves for whatever is to come in late July in London with the assurance that no matter how great the deception, 
no matter how horrendous the act of terrorism may be, in the end, truth must triumph over falsehood. That's our response. Thank you. It was very reassuring. Uh, one more question from Daring Dean's channel, uh, from uh, subscribers of his. How do we survive the coming wars? Can remote villages in the countryside guarantee the safety of Muslims from the upcoming destruction of the nuclear clash between Gog and Magog? I think the people who are most vulnerable to be wiped out in the coming nuclear war are those resident in North America and Europe. They're likely to be wiped out. And that's because I believe the Zionists have already exploited modern Western civilization to get all that they needed to get from them. They've used them as guinea pigs to fight their wars for them. And uh, now that Israel is poised to take over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world, it is becoming increasingly inconvenient for Israel to have this baggage on its shoulders, modern Western civilization. The modern Western man has a kind of a mysterious energy in him, intellectual energy. If you look at every single branch of knowledge, modern Western man has extended the frontiers of knowledge. If you look at the Olympic Games, modern Western man is winning all the medals. If you look at military power, modern Western man has the greatest military power in the world today. So there's some kind of a mysterious energy in modern Western man and of course woman. And if modern Western man opens his eyes and begins to see the reality that he has been exploited and taken for a ride by the Zionists, He's being used now as a guinea pig. As Western man opens his eyes and begins to understand the reality, he is already emerging as a formidable threat, more formidable than Muslims. And so I believe the master plan is to get rid of modern Western man before his eyes open big enough to be able to understand and to constitute the gravest of all threats to Israel. The nicest way, the easiest way, the most effective way is to try to foment a clash between the two superpowers. So you have thousands of nuclear weapons being used one against the other. And that will be the end of modern Western civilization. What can we do? In Islam we have the belief the life and death are in the hands of the one God. If he has ordained death, then nothing that we can do can prevent death. And if he has not ordained death, then no one can take our lives. It's called faith. And once you have that faith, you can continue your work. Regardless of what's happening in the world, you continue the struggle until the time comes for you to lay down your burden and go into the earth. <coughs> but it is permissible for you to make a hijra or migration, migration, to try to move from a place where there is greater danger to a place where there is greater security. And the most, vulnerable, the most vulnerable place in the world to be today and for the next 20 years or so would be in the mega cities. The mega cities. So if you want to survive, your chances are much better if you get out of London and New York and Paris <laughs> and, and Chicago and uh, New Delhi 
and in Karachi and Jakarta and go to the countryside. The more remote the countryside, the better. And uh, produce your own food because food is increasingly becoming contaminated, becoming more garbage than food and uh, produce your own food and become self-sufficient in food and in water. And this is your best way of surviving. Words of wisdom, dear Sheikh. Let me move on. More questions. Um, before you move on, yes. before you move on, yes. are, you, are you still going to remain in London? I am going to the countryside two or three times a week. I have found an oasis. There are videos on, on my channel just recently on farms. I, I'm trying very hard to get out. And I meet people in the city that are unhappy in the city. It's not easy to move to the countryside. It, it, it takes a new mental approach as well. But before you move, find a wife, please. Don't go to the countryside alone. Oh, inshallah, I wish. I wish. You never know. When it rains, it pours. Okay, boys. <laughs> um, look, I just have a comment now. It's not a question. It was a comment left on a video, and it grabbed my eye, my attention regarding Syria. This is a clear-cut war for Israel. Nothing else. Syria is one army which can take care of Israel. Every American has to look into this angle. Who is benefiting? Neither Saudi or Syria, nor America, only one country, Israel. It's either luck for them, or it is well played by them. Yes, I think this is correct. That the Zionists are at the root of the uprising. They're the ones who have planned it uh, long, long years in advance. But uh, what is missing in that analysis is that Syria is not just another country for them. This is do or die for them. They must succeed in Syria, even if they have to open all the gates of hell. And that's about to happen, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I f get to interview a few people, and they're very often um, against the, the Western interference in Syria. But they won't point a finger at Israel or the Zionists. They have to be kept out. Mm -hmm. You can talk about the CIA and the Americans and Hillary Clinton. That's no problem. But don't mention Israel or the Zionist plot. Okay. Um, what, a more question, sir. I would like to know if he thinks Turkey has been secretly encouraging and supporting the anti-Assad terrorists from the beginning. I, I think the... the uh, this is from Coriana Green. I think she's asking... You know, how long have the Turkish people been, or government been, uh, facilitating the insurrection? I think that uh, the Turkish government uh, is, I, I prefer to give them the benefit of the doubt and to think well of them in respect of their hearts, that their hearts are not corrupted. It is that the minds are brainwashed and that they are being used and manipulated in much the same way that modern Western civilization was used and manipulated for centuries. And only now is Western man opening his eyes and beginning to understand and realize true story. So too with the Turkish government. I believe that there was a sophisticated effort of brainwashing. And that this, at the heart of that effort of brainwashing was a Sufi religious movement based in, uh, which has a, uh, its headquarters in the United States. Um, they have played a very sinister role. The, the, the Mustak, Mustafa Kemal group of secular Turks already have an alliance with Israel, the Turkish armed forces. And Essentially, they only nominally Muslims. They only have Islam by name. But the Turkish countryside was still Muslim. And it was that Turkish country, countryside which was targeted by this Sufi movement and brainwashed to produce this government. 
And this government in turn believes, I believe, that they're doing the right thing. What they did in Libya, they are, they are convinced that they're doing the right thing and this is morally correct. And so it's a case of brainwashing. Uh, I don't think that the Turkish government may have been part and parcel from day one. But along the way, they were taken on board. Uh, it is a Zionist plot from the very beginning. Uh, but the Turkish government and the Turkish armed forces were taken on board. Uh, sorry, not the armed forces, the government. The armed forces may have been there long, long before. But the government was taken on board later. Um, uh, we don't know, we can't say when it happened, but most certainly, most certainly, the Turkish government is now comfortable with NATO and comfortable that it's doing the right thing. And this is, the, this is where the danger lies, that they can be convinced that uh, if they give the approval for an armed invasion of Syria, that they'll be doing the right thing. But they're playing a wrong game because I believe that Putin is going to respond in a manner which will surprise them for the rest of their lives. The Sheikh wants to build villages for only Muslims to live in and have their own system. Um, the globe lived among different people. The Muslims have lived, I don't know what, I'm sorry, if somebody sees something bad taking place, he should not run and ignore it, otherwise he will be part of the problem. I, is that a fair uh, question that has been presented? Well, I think it's a very stupid thing to build a Muslim village with only Muslims. Uh, my language is fairly harsh. I say it's a stupid thing. <laughs> I think <laughs> you've asked. Stupid. To Good. build a village for only Muslims. Uh, a more intelligent thing would be to build a Muslim village and to invite non-Muslims to come and live with us on the basis of a friendly relationship and on the basis of an understanding of a norm of public conduct. For example, we are turning away from that alcohol-ridden society. We are turning away from that society of nudity and public obscenity. We want to build a clean environment for our children. So to the extent that there are Muslims who want to do that, and we can get Jews to join with us, and Christians, and Hindus, and Buddhists, and you are not hostile to Islam, and you can agree with us on a code of public conduct, that there is no public nudity in the Muslim village that you're not going to be drinking and getting what is called stone drunk or binge drinking. <laughs> not in our village. This appears to me to be an intelligent way to bring together people of different religions, of different tribes, and show that we can live together as a family. But to build a Muslim village for Muslims alone, that's stupid. Thank you for clarifying. In London, you cannot go down the street without seeing someone carrying a can of beer. The questions for sake of whom I'm saying, I have more. What is your view on the future of the Kurdish conflict between Iran, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria? How will the Kurdish conflict shape the interests of Zionists, or will it be a blow for Zionists? Uh, this is from Umer Bat in Kashmir. Wherever there are a people who have been oppressed by the modern secular state which has emerged from the Western world, the Zionists would look upon those people as an opportunity waiting to be exploited. And so the more that Turkey oppresses the Kurds, and Iraq and Syria and Iran oppress the Kurds, deny them their language, deny them their culture, deny them liberty. The more the Kurds are oppressed, the more likely it is that the Zionists will come along one day and say, we can deliver you. 
we can deliver you from oppression and then take them for a ride and use them to advance the Zionist agenda. This <laughs> is I already, I believe, already taking place um, behind the scenes. Uh, it is possible, I can't say for certain, that you may have the Kurdish mercenaries already fighting in Syria against the regime. I've heard Kurdistan is a Zionist project at this time. I have a personal question. I don't know what it means, but I'm just reading what is typed. I didn't have time to prepare. What kind of new rule for Tunisia is planned in the new Arab world scenario of the times of a greater Israel coming and for Algeria? There are voices on Tunisian news saying that Tunisia has become a platform for terrorists coming from everywhere since the borders to Libya and Algeria are not so safe. Thank you. From Java Gurk. I am not, uh, as they say in French, au courant with what's happening in Tunisia and Algeria and Morocco because my attention has been focused elsewhere. Uh, but the master plan is working in that the Islamic, so-called Islamic parties won the elections and have formed the government. Uh, but uh, they are um, behaving in much the same way that other so-called Islamic parties and Islamic governments are operating in the Arab world as a result of the elections. Um, and that is that they are acting in a way which is, which is um, likely to lead them to be exploited by Israel, to advance Israel's agenda, to act in such a way eventually that Israel can claim that they now pose a threat to Israel. Uh, beyond this, uh, Maurice, I am afraid I can't comment other than superficially because I have not been focusing my attention on that part of the world. Okay, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll make this next question uh, uh, the, the last one. There are plenty more. Uh, maybe I'll ask you something afterwards. Can you please ask the following question to Sheikh Imran? Today, Iran and Armenia, the first nation to adopt Christianity as its official religion, signed a security agreement. Does this signify what Imran has been predicting on Islam and Eastern Christianity will join hands? It's a positive sign when Iran can sign a security pact with Armenia. It's a positive sign because it is, a, it is a, 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 an event which is moving in the direction of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, that you Muslims are going to make or forge an alliance with Rome. And Rome of the Quran, of course, is Byzantium, Eastern, Eastern Christian world, and Armenia is part of that Eastern Christian world. But Iran has already had, already forged close ties with Russia. And Pakistan is moving in a uh, like an old Ford now and then stop and go but <laughs> moving towards Russia uh, and uh, when the civil war takes place in Turkey I believe we'll find Turkish alliance with Ru Muslim Turkey with Russia as well the, con the conquest of Constantinople can only have one military significance for me a Muslim conquest of Constantinople to break the NATO grip on the city can only have one military consequence, significance, and that is that it opens up the bus for us, for the Russian Navy to have free passage into the Mediterranean. I can't think of any other significant military uh, implication. And so the, in, in the um, security pact with Armenia makes sense. It makes sense, and I believe that Iran is moving in the right direction. Um, 
what just happened, P Pakistan, you mentioned it, and it has just opened the uh, passage of NATO p p troops, it's whatever, NATO supplies again into Afghanistan. It, when so clearly the majority of the population are against it, what is the situation in Pakistan? The Pakistan armed forces succeeded in extracting the price that they wanted. It's a question of US dollars. And they got the US dollars that they wanted. I think it's more in, in excess of 1 billion US. In excess of 1 billion US. And they're now hoping that they can ride the tide of internal resentment in the country. Um, but time will tell. Well, Sheikh Imran Hussain, seriously, I could talk to you for a lot longer, but we have been going an hour almost, and uh, may maybe we should stop here. I, I, otherwise, I, I would gladly uh, ask you, what is the ISI doing in Afghanistan? Is it is it supporting the, the Taliban? I, I can I have many more questions. I think it's better for us to stop now because uh, there's just this much that our listening audience can digest. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know much about the uh, ISI, and I don't use the name Taliban at all. I only speak about the authentic Islamic resistance to oppression in Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can't thank you enough, and I, and I hope we, we, we have you more regularly. You're most welcome, Maris. Most welcome. Thank you, Sheikh Imran Hossein. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.